Hi everybody, I'm going to talk to you about this topic of scales of real time and I'm going to sort of show you a little bit of my work. Okay, like probably many of you today in the audience, I work in multiple modes and media and multiple scales. And so this consists of researching with data sets, designing with algorithms, fabricating with robots shown here, um, engineering interactive spatial media systems like this one. Um, building diverse audiences across digital platforms, producing films that subvert the codes of social media, creating exhibitions that push the limits of discursive and immersive aesthetic forms, maybe you can see some of that tomorrow, and making models of smart cities and their control syntax. And so my research examines how new media, networked infrastructures and the techno sciences influence the politics of architecture and the city. Um, I've developed a method of working that uses design as a means of critical research and spatial practice. For instance, much of my recent work stems from an investigation into modernism's response to new technology and computation. Um, but I apply this research to the most contemporary of design practices, working in virtual reality, advanced fabrication, and new spatial media in an interdisciplinary form of something I'm calling applied technology studies. So I, I make and I think through making, let's say. I work in this way to, I hope, redesign the relationship between computation and the multiple scales, mediums and spatial logics of late capitalism. To understand how computational media determines our situation, how it shapes the codes of our social interactions, powers the data-driven decision-making of the buildings we inhabit, optimizes the unequal distribution of goods and resources in our cities and automates the production of human subjectivities. Architecture, technology, cities and subjects. Uh, this is the arrangement of concepts, sites and terms through which my practice operates at multiple scales and showing how all four co-produce each other, what is the relationship between cities, the subjects, technology and architecture um, and this is the sort of work that I try to um, think through. Uh, so today I'm going to speak in more detail about a few of my projects that I showed very quickly in that opening video. Um, I need more smiles from the front row, okay? So I'm looking at the smart row. Front row is like, you're my vibe, okay? Give me, I, I saw you and you were like concentrated really hard and it scared me. Um, you had the concentrating face. All right, I appreciate that. Vibes, vibes, vibes. All right, good. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk to you about a few of those projects. And uh, I'm going to then talk about this scales of real time, one of my research projects that I've been working on and how it sort of relates to a lot of the things I'm doing. Um, and then I'll conclude. So let's just start by uh, talking about this research project, real time. So a human is a particle in a linear flow. A human is a skinned mesh in a complex flock. A human is one part of the stroke thickness in a network of lines. So goes the depiction of individual identity in three recent real-time computer simulations of urban movement. Um, a New York Times article, a just almost released PlayStation 4 game, uh, a PlayStation 5 now, and a new software as a service urban planning tool. What do these examples from news media, interactive gaming and city management reveal about what it means to be a human in the contemporary city. How did they shape the urban imaginary and what compels so many computer operators to obsessively watch how humans move? Uh, each simulation shown here shows the movement of bodies but in different ways and to different degrees of real time. Um, I'm interested in understanding how this urge to track, visualize and anticipate the movement of urban populations in real time is deployed as a technique by different actors to shape subjects and territories. The first simulation um, is a data-driven news article published on the New York Times website um, a few years ago titled How the Virus Got Out. And it chronicles the spread of the coronavirus from the Wuhan region in China to the far reaches of the planet. The web page consists of live computer simulations of hundreds of millions of people's movements. Uh, 
uh, visualize the smooth flows of dot swatch dot png particles gleaned from multiple cell phone data sources. The simulation is coded in the JavaScripting programming language and consists of over 60,000 lines of code and scrolling the page triggers different dynamic visualizations. Um, a good fraction of the 60,000 lines of computer code runs different subroutines that reconstruct pre-process location and geospatial data into different historical simulations of human movement. Um, here, the degree of real time is in the scroll activated near real time responsive interactions. Um, I find myself asking why it was so important for these data visualization routines to run as live computer simulations within the browser and why they combine so much data with the narrative content. Uh, why spend close to 10,000 lines of coding labor optimizing the, si um, the site for runtime performance rather than just pre processing this all as animation frames? and encoding them as video files. Um, so clearly, there's a certain value that's placed on these information visualizations appearing live, on them running in real time, and on the authority that communicating with computer models produces. And there's also this buildup of anxiety and anxious anticipation in the users of this website and their cognition um, with every scroll of the page that is pleasurably rewarded with the release of dopamines when a new visualization commences. The second simulation can be seen in the trailer for Humanity, um, a soon to be released video game by THA and Enhance. Uh, set to hypnotic beats scored by Jap legendary Japanese musician Cornelius, the one minute teaser is a dizzying array of tracking and dolly shots capturing scenes of mayhem um, featuring massive crowds of computer-generated humans pressing, elbowing, and pushing past and often into each other with careless and violent abandonment in a series of abstract urban environments. Everyone wants to play this game now. Um, although, this, um, although this specific media is an MP4 video file, um, I assume it is showing documentation from in-game play developed using the Unity gaming engine with the behavior of the digitally skinned humans being informed by agent-based modeling techniques. Um, these humans run at 60 frames per second real time, based on a series of local rules which make each play slightly different. The third simulation is available in Replica, a quote, next generation urban planning tool developed by a similarly named startup um, that was spun out of Cyborg Labs um, and owned by Google parent Alphabet uh, before it was recently disbanded. The specifics of this simulation have to be pieced together from friendly promotional videos, helpful blog posts, government procurement forms, and a confidential methodology document with protected trade secrets that was accidentally made public, which I then looked at. So Replica produces simulations of what is called synthetic populations. So virtual humans moving around different US cities. Um, and these virtual humans go about their daily lives ambling from home to work, to lunch, to shopping or other, using different modes of transport. The company uses machine learning methods to translate, quote, near real time, uh, location and behavior data tracked from real humans that represent a small percentage of the actual population of a city, which they then convert into abstract persona models, um, and this allows them to sort of form different decision-making matrices. So this is sort of shown here. These persona models are then matched with virtual humans that are statistically correct representations of an entire city's population based on census data. So basically, they have actual movement of real humans, like a small percentage, and then they sort of abstract this away to an entire population based on census data. And, and so, you know, Replica is now creating all of these sort of um, near real time simulations of an entire city's population, which they then sell back to municipal leaders. Um, and all of this is presented, you know, this is like, think about it, there's millions of human beings moving around in their models, but it's presented to us in this really sort of no nonsense uh, kind of uh, simple aggregate view where we just see uh, lines with slightly thicker um, strokes and that represents all of this work that they've done. But the back end to this required so much information extraction and collecting to get to here and processing. Um, so these three simulations 
uh, the results of this longer kind of history that I want to talk about. But just to sort of unpack this like different scales of operations, let's think back to that first example, the scroll activated New York Times uh, example, right? So you're sitting at your computer and you push a button on your keyboard and when you press that button on your keyboard, uh, something updates on your screen. So probably a pretty typical scenario that many of us deal with every day. Does that? I also drew this. This is why I'm good with computers. So forgive me, okay? Um, so here I am. I push a button and my computer updates. And then my eyeball sees what happens, right? I process the update and I might press another button or do something, right? So, so that first kind of scale of real time is between my keyboard and my screen and the sort of electro circuit um, event that's being rerouted through my computer circuitry. The second one might be the information that's being processed by my eyeball and it's coming back and it's sort of, you know, now I'm in a loop between my eyeball and the screen are in a loop now. The third scale of real time is that when I press that button, it actually routes a, um, routes a packet through telecommunication networks. It goes to, I don't know, an edge computing cloud distributed cloud um, network server for the New York Times, and then that packet comes back. So actually, we have these three different scales. We have the scale of real time between my body and the screen. We have the scale of real time between how quickly a keyboard input and the screen updates, and we have a scale between my computer and a sort of a vast sort of, you know, territorial scale telecommunications network. Another way we could think about that is that, you know, my screen is kind of, you know, there's a sort of a loop happening between my PC and my screen. There's a loop happening between my brain and my screen. Um, and there's a loop happening between my PC and my server. Or it could be that, I don't know, there's these like nested scalar real times. There's my screen and my PC are talking. My finger and my PC are in a loop. My brain and my finger are constantly being controlled. So we, we start to think that all of these things are operating different degrees of real time, right? That when I press a button on my keyboard, a packet is sent to an overseas server and comes back to me in less than 200 milliseconds. When I press a button on my keyboard, the pixel on my computer is routed through peripheral devices um, on my PC and the frame buffer updates in about 100 milliseconds. And when, a, when the sort of light in my visual field changes, that information is processed through my brain and a signal is relayed to my finger in less than 13 milliseconds. So this is the different nested scales of real time that operates at the scale of your brain to a vast territorial computation that I've been thinking about. So in order to see that New York Times uh, computer simulation, we've had to create this vast planetary architecture that connects our brain to our finger to all of this. Is that cool? All right, so that's what we're talking about. When I started working on this project, it was actually, um, I received the Epic Mega Grant in 2019. Do you know Epic Games? Uh, they're the makers of Fortnite, right? And um, they asked me to use their software, their Unreal Gaming Engine, to develop architecture curriculum and tools. And so just this is where I started working on this real-time project. Develop architecture curriculum and tools. And so just this is where I started working on this real-time project. Um, and, and so this developed from research I'd been doing in my lab and through my practice using um, gaming engines and virtual reality and thinking through extended reality technologies and all sorts of sort of simulations like this. And so when I started to work on the Epic Games and the Epic Mega Grants project was launched in 2019 with a total funding pool of close to $100 million that would be awarded to any individual or entity um, for if using the Unreal Gaming Engine to do something interesting, let's say. Um, and so at the time, Epic was marketing their product to um, people in my field, architects, as a revolutionary real-time 3D visualization tool. And so I think the purpose there was that Epic wanted to sort of end the tyranny of the V-Ray bucket. So does anyone do 3D visualization? Has anyone? Yeah? A little bit? Did you ever see this? Have you spent some of your time doing that? Do you know what I'm talking about here? You've sleepless, you know this? Yeah, you all know, you've seen it. So, so this is a kind of an offline, not real-time render. And so the appeal of Epic's tool, the way it was being marketed, is that there's a real-time future in which the amount of time it takes you to see a 3D visualization is the amount of time it takes you to see it. Right? That you would get, uh, uh, you would no longer have to spend hours or days uh, processing something on your CPU that on your GPU would sort of instantly be available to you. And so when I started to work on this project, I was interested in Epic's mobilization of this computational term, real time. 
and its origins in this project, the semi-automatic ground environment. Um, as a military program of large computers and associated networking equipment. As Paul Edwards reminds us, Cold War demands for centralized command and control over vast territories in a modular, flexible, and efficient manner is the context in which um, the real-time electronic computer that we all use was invented. So this is the reason, in order to produce this real-time image of the North American airspace, for purposes of you know, monitoring possible Soviet intrusions into America, um, the electronic computer was invented. And so for my project, I wanted to know what it meant that my profession, its design tools, and its metrics for productivity was shaped by this real-time military logic and you know, showing tools like this. And so this current push for a real-time future is being facilitated by advances in computer communication and media technologies. Most importantly, previously isolated advances within military and entertainment domains have now converged on the city um, as a new marketplace for real-time urban simulations like this tool. Um, maybe some of you have heard of digital twins, where many cities are now attempting to produce digital replicas of everything and to digitally replicate uh, dynamic systems within the city. And this is showing example from Virtual Singapore. This linking of telecommunication infrastructures digital computation and immersive screen-based media by new urban forms like data centers, control rooms, sensor towers, um, and occasional fortnight like World Cups that maybe you've seen, and new urban technologies like digital twins, massive open online worlds, synthetic populations, and virtual humans um, is what I am defining as uh, real-time urbanism. Cool. And so my project, Real-Time Urbanism, examines uh, simulation technologies that virtualize urban environments and urban subjects. And what this project asks are, uh, what are the records, the tools, the methods used to simulate a city for reasons of control and monetization? So here we can see, in order for Replica to produce some of its models, a huge amount of data extraction and information collecting has to happen, right? So there's a kind of a normalization of massive amounts of monitoring and you could say surveillance of populations and monetization. The computer models that drive many of these simulations are based on abstract theories of individual and collective human decision making. Um, and so these theories are informed by genealogies of knowledge explicitly rooted in social ordering belief systems. And so this is a really interesting paper that actually tracks the Cambridge Analytica, the theories that drove the Cambridge Analytica models back to eugenics and white supremacy sort of um, social belief systems. Um, examples such as virtual Iraqis performing nonverbal cues for military sensitivity training and software developed for the US Army or synthetic populations based on household units traveling through a city's transportation network for study by traffic engineers um, also reveal the biases and assumptions behind a lot of these theories. And so decision making based on these problematic models of human behavior produce unfair outcomes to favor those in power. Um, simulations, real-time simulations, and their increasing ubiquity also raise ethical questions. Um, how can we think about the rights of actual humans when their decisions and movements are rendered as virtual analogs? How do we better advocate for the publics whose gestures, behaviors, and movement patterns have been recorded, quantified, and put into digital motion to drive the very insights that are reinscribed back onto their bodies? Importantly, part of my research is looking for new ways to resist and undermine invasive and pervasive technologies. Um, and so just to return to the digital twin and some examples shown here, uh, these are virtual uh, replicas of different cities from around the world that we've been tracking. The digital twin is kind of being sold as this you know, amazing new technology um, that is going to help optimize and accelerate and make more efficient the management of cities, right? So, um, different kind of crises are presented to us. There's ecological crises, there's uh, lack of public um, resources, there's booming sort of population um, increases. And so enter into this as new digital technologies to help city managers uh, resolve many of these problems, right? Um, and, and so it's sold to us as this kind of new type of virtualization that has only been enabled by, you know, uh, technologies like the Unreal Gaming Engine and all sorts of other sort of 3D platform. Um, and so in this sort of attempt to uh, you know, define some of the origins of this uh, 
virtualization of our cities and to actually recognize that many of the technologies we use have military origins. I want to turn to this example from 1972 of a project called uh, SIMNET, which stands for Simulated Networking. And so this is a series of diagrams that actually lays out a concept that's very similar to the digital twin we now have um, for purposes of US military um, operations. So you can see in the top left corner, this is from a paper written by um, Colonel Jack Thorpe in 1972, a white paper that um, offers a new kind of technology, speculates on a new type of technology where um, any enemy aggression that's detected by a sensor in the physical space can then be in real time represented on what he's calling the holographic electronic sand table. We might now just talk about, think of that as a 3D simulation, right? 3D virtual rip. Um, and then this allows air crews to rehearse and plan different possible responses and then that mission is executed in real time um, on the ground. And so when I sort of saw this, uh, you know, like early cybernetic sort of fantasy of how simulation and um, information collection and representation all kind of came together, um, I started to look at this project in more detail. And so this is um, Colonel Jack Thorpe here on the left uh, in SimNet. Uh, and so the purpose of SimNet was to basically um, network up uh, simulators and to use cheaper commercially available hardware at the time military simulators were really large and one-offs and and so this is showing some of the different entities that they created simulator models for from tanks to aircraft this allowed basically there were physical simulators in which army personnel would uh, be networked together and they could um, participate in uh, massive open online virtual simulations maybe something similar to some of the things we now know, and just to show you a little bit of, you know, and this is about 19, SimNet was in operation from 1985 to the mid-90s. It's a um, department, it's a DARPA project, Department Advanced Research Projects for the Army. Um, and just think about like Doom, did anyone ever play Doom? Right, Doom came out like about similar time, and you know how, and by the aviation crew what the cable is like. helicopters at Fort Rucker. As we flew over, the USS Wasp icon that we saw in our screens, our signal showed up on their radar screens, which is an amazing feat when you think about it. We had Army, Navy, and Marines all playing in the same network on their own systems. That's the first time that has ever been done. <laughs> um, so I guess the reason why I'm showing this is that what came out of SimNet is this kind of system architecture of a distributed uh, simulator networking and and the protocols and the standards and and so the, the ambition of SimNet was to be able to network any physical object and connect them right so whether and then when you were sort of participating in that um, network it was um, indistinguishable to you what was actually a physical object what was a simulation of a virtually reproduced physical object that all of these things like actual humans virtual humans uh, virtually simulated actual humans, all of these things would be rendered indistinguishable. And so um, these types of, uh, you know, we might look at this and think of it as the Internet of Things, or we might look at this now and think of it as the digital twin, or we might look at this and think of it as massive open online gaming. And so many of these kind of ideas of um, massive virtual worlds have sort of started here. Um, and at the time, SimNet was really trying to increase its frames per second, and it was rendering it um, in uh, 15 frames per second. And so just to kind of, you know, for me, um, as I've, and I'm going to shift and start to show some projects, how I'm starting to um, respond to some of this history, right, and to some of this, like, uh, the desires to connect everything in real time and render all information visible for purposes of technocratic management. Um, and so I'm going to present four projects that are at different scales that are, for me, interventions into sort of these real-time discourses and these ways that we think about technology now. And, and so really thinking about, you know, how can we use uh, real-time media, real-time electronic computation and communication in ways to kind of maybe try to imagine other possibilities outside of these military sort of desires for command and control. Seems good? You with me? All right, ready? We're going to do the shift now. And so the first project uh, that I'll show is called Share from 2016, and that's operating the scale of the room. Um, the second project is operating the scale of an institution. The third project is operating the scale of the city. And the fourth project, uh, which you can go see in Axioma uh, tomorrow, is operating the scale of both the house and the state. Okay. The first project, Share, um, is a collaboration. And many of my projects are collaborative. Um, it's a collaboration with Caitlin Blanchfield, Glenn Cummings, Joffa Kolb, and Leah Meisterlin, shown here. 
Uh, and so at the time, it was an um, exhibition for the um, Oslo Architecture Triennial. Um, it was a one-year intervention project, and it was in 2016. And if you kind of recall, um, at that time, Airbnb was really sort of emerging as a platform. Um, and so we know that digital technologies of the so-called sharing economy have transformed our cities, and they've also transformed our understanding of domestic space um, and housing infrastructure. And so with this project, um, what I really want to talk about is how personal spaces were sort of being imaged by um, platforms like Airbnb. And so when we were asked to produce a one-year research project into Airbnb and sharing economy models, um, what we decided to do as an intervention was to produce our own app in response to that. And so um, our, pro our app is called Share. Um, you can see sort of the video tutorial here. And it's really similar to Airbnb, except it had at the time an imaging capability. So you could basically what we allowed people to do was to share anything. So you could share an, an object in your room. You could share public space or domestic space. And, and so we were really interested in how the act of imaging something, objectifying it, choosing what the boundaries of something is, and arguing for why some public space should be shareable in some way. Um, and we sort of ran a series of workshops over the years and um, started to build a new taxonomy of the city as a sort of series of objects. And so the only kind of um, three things we did that were sort of slightly different to Airbnb was that we made the terms of exchange um, something that could be negotiated off platform. So people could choose, we would put people in contact with each other and then people would say, hey, I want to share this thing for like a game of chess or something. And so we would put actually the terms of exchange um, in the hands of users. Uh, we also changed our um, uh, data collecting and ethics policy um, and we did one visual change which was to introduce the way of sharing through objects. Um, so here we were really thinking about how um, we could kind of produce a counter model to existing uh, real-time systems in some way. And so it was community driven, we did a series of workshops to learn what kind of tools they might, public might actually want um, and we exhibited in Oslo at the Trinali there. The second project is called Modern Management Methods and this is a collaboration with uh, Caitlin Blanchfield, who's an architectural historian. And so it's two exhibition projects that look at two different historical, sort of really iconic modernist buildings. Um, and so you can see the exhibition here that was shown at the shed in uh, New York City. It's a kind of a real-time digital media um, display system. Here I was really thinking about, you know, how some of those techniques of attention management that I sort of uh, pointed out to in what was happening in the New York Times article could be used as a way to sort of uh, communicate information to the user in different ways. And so the project here consisted of us visiting the United Nations headquarters in New York City and here we're in the Security Council chamber uh, and we were interested in this building because it underwent a massive capital renovation after the 9-11 attack. Um, and so um, you might notice the UN is on sovereign territory so it doesn't have to abide by New York City fire codes or New York City you know, building performance codes. But after um, the 9-11 attacks, the mayor of New York went into the UN and said, you know, we've seen the buildings can be weaponized. Uh, you're next. You know, symbolic architecture is at stake. And if you don't bring up your building to New York City fire code, because it had never been renovated since it was built in the 1950s, we're not going to come in if something happens. And the second building we looked at was in the Weisenhof Siedling in Stuttgart. So both of these buildings are kind of, this is on the United Nations uh, World Heritage List, and that both buildings had the famous um, architect Le Corbusier involved in some way. Um, and this is the UN building we looked at. And so we're kind of interested in, uh, at least when the UN underwent its uh, renovations, uh, the historic image of the building was maintained, uh, but all of this new technology was inserted into it. For instance, the curtain wall that we're seeing here uh, was removed and it was redetailed in order to be able to absorb a vehicle bomb attack from First Avenue. And so we're kind of interested in how sort of, you know, if, if in the 1950s glass stood for a kind of um, openness and a sort of, you know, a universal kind of language of uh, solidarity and camaraderie, here now glass was kind of redetailed as a sort of a uh, risk management and security object. Um, and so we kind of produced a book on this that you can see. And these are some of the x-rays where we were trying to identify moments in the building where uh, these new technologies had been inserted into the cavity. And so this is where uh, new fire um, systems had been inserted into the walls, into the door, sorry. And, and so the exhibition itself, it kind of starts to put 
uh, the x-rays we took into relation with documents you can see in the right from the UN archive that trace all of these works in the building. So in a sense, the documents locate the transformations in the building in some way. And so here, you know, the real-time kind of uh, mode of working really informed the exhibition display system. The second project is a collaboration with Mark Wasuda. Here's Mark and I in um, Songdo. Uh, we're entering the eco zone. It's pretty good, right? No, Front row, nothing, okay. I'm gonna ask for some more. Uh, and so this project's actually two exhibitions and I'll show a little bit from both. Um, and the project analyzes the rhetoric of the smart city movement um, and its historic foundations in modernism and computation to understand the agency of architecture within an algorithmic uh, urbanism. And so you've probably heard about the smart city, right? Like, and much ambiguity and criticism surrounds this hazily defined metropolis. Is it an opportunistic label easily applied to any urban development? You know, everything's kind of smart. Is it a coherent movement? Is it a clever repackaging of essential infrastructures? Um, and, or by technology companies. Um, and if the modernist city of hard infrastructure gave way to the machine logics of the smart city, uh, what's really happened to architecture in this shift uh, to it being digitized? Um, and so it's a series of exhibitions uh, where we looked at two different smart cities. And I'm showing some images from uh, those projects. And so the first project we looked at um, is called Control Syntax Rio. It was at, shown at the Hetnoy Institute in Rotterdam in 2016 and later in New York City. And in this project, we really started this project by being asked to analyze a space like this. And this is the uh, Center for Operations Rio, or as it's more commonly known, CORE. It was a really visible cybernetic uh, IBM smart city initiative that was built in the lead up to the Olympics. And so Control Syntax Rio, our project, uh, models a traffic route through Rio de Janeiro from Copacabana Beach in the bottom right here to Maracanã Stadium. Uh, both of these were beach volleyball and soccer competition sites for the 2016 Summer Olympics. Um, built in 2010, uh, CORE was built in 2010 um, in reaction to a landslide. And CORE was planned to anticipate and respond to future disasters and infrastructure failures. Um, equally important, CORE was intended to demonstrate uh, Rio's commitment to improved urban administration and traffic management. So the purpose of the center of operations is to manage the flow of traffic in the city. CORE was heralded as this incredible urban feedback system and control center that would combine disaster response, urban sensor monitoring, um, and, and form of intelligent traffic administration that was meant to speed the circulation of traffic during the crush of the Summer Olympics. Uh, the technical and conceptual armature for CORE originated in IBM's Smarter City initiative. And so CORE's primary tasks are to monitor, assess, and represent the metabolism of the city and to respond to actual or potential implications that drain, slow, or block it. Uh, through the logic of IBM code around which it is built, CORE measures abnormalities according to four escalating scales of intensity. Um, incident, event, emergency or crisis. And so how this scale is registered and represented and how it determines response formed the foundation of what we're terming Rio's control syntax. And overlaid on the traffic uh, route of our project, uh, control syntax Rio also traces a decision path through CORE's uh, algorithmic decision-making matrix. And so the model in our project aligns the material traffic infrastructure of the city with the immaterial syntax of CORE's urban management code. Um, and at first glance, course control syntax appears banal, maybe even uh, managerial. Uh, and so if something happens, yet it is also charged with potential crisis. For example, if protest erupts, then traffic will have to be redirected to avoid paralysis. If buildings explode, routes will need to be cleared to usher response teams. Uh, explosions, fires, protests, landslides, rallies and sudden tropical storms combined with faulty traffic lights, accidents, spilled trucks, burning buses and quotidian congestions as elements of cause control syntax. And the control room shown here um, and the one that we looked at in Songdo act as this, uh, this active demonstration of urban sensing, information extraction, feedback and management. It's a theater of 
control. And so this reformation of urban vision and the decision-making trees has a long history that we can track back to conferences like this. And all of this is what we're calling smart city control syntax. Great. And so just to kind of finish off with the last project, if that one was really looking at how real-time sensing of cities, real-time representation of that behavior and, you know, these spaces where all of that information kind of comes in, spaces that, you know, the information in that exceeds human perception, right? Like there's so much uh, information that human eyes aren't even meant to process. Much of what's going on in there is automated and it's machines talking to each other, right? But that we need these kind of architectural spaces as demonstrations of a type of image of how the city is being administered through real-time infrastructures. Um, this last project is really looking at how some of those technologies that, you know, as I've shown, have military origins that then get sort of um, used to manage cities then start to enter into our home. And as Jana said in his they start to kind of, um, you know, allow us to sort of command and control some of our most intimate spaces. Um, and so this project, My Domestic Routines, and I'm just going to give you like a teaser because you should come to the exhibition. Uh, I don't want to give it all away. Uh, but it comprises of a film and a physical installation. I'll show a little bit from that film. And, and the installation displays um, a catalog of readily available smart products sourced from IKEA. Um, and a sort of a interactive and a, a pre-programmed routine uh, connects the sort of IKEA system to devices to each other and puts them into a kind of never-ending performance of uh, detection, response, interaction, and automation. Um, the film, which I'll show you in one second, a little clip from it, uh, presents a composite image of uh, Fazin Lodvijan, yours truly, um, and my home, rendered through the attentive vision of the smart home industry. Uh, the film reveals how regimes of monitoring uh, in it, you can see, um, have produced a neurotic domestic subject, me, who's simultaneously obsessed with seeking ever more representations of my own domestic life while securitizing myself against the fears lurking in the American suburban imaginary. Um, you know, I'm trying to argue through this project that our domestic routines um, may be, seem banal, even scripted and contrived, uh, but the exhibition captures a feedback loop between domestic desire, data collection, and the insidious possibilities um, of convenience. And so if, if the film sort of shows a, a kind of a narrative that talks about my own biography in some way and how I've been shaped by these technologies of convenience, but also state technology, like larger scale technologies like immigration, like zoning. And I'm really trying to think about uh, what outside of architecture, what's the kind of political, social, regulatory um, planning context that uh, really shaped the possibilities of what the inside of your house is and how that shapes who you are. And I'm trying to sort of understand that through my own story in some way. And it sort of finishes off with here where, you know, you've probably seen like all of these highly gendered uh, devices that are given, um, you know, they're, they're generally named um, women's kind of names and they sort of have uh, women's voices, right? And they, they kind of are presented to us as really cute sort of insidious, you know, cute sort of... Um, calm and, uh, you know, not in any way sort of uh, alarming or threatening objects, right? So there's a kind of an aesthetic of cuteness and convenience um, that's sold to us as a way to bring these, like, massive sort of monitoring devices into our homes. And, and so I was kind of interested in um, the aesthetics that uh, 
circulate between cuteness and surveillance. And so here you're seeing a kind of um, all the possible permutations of uh, smart sort of behavior that I can do in my house. And so, you know, that's kind of what's happening there. And you'll see a little bit more of it um, at the exhibition tomorrow if you come. Um, and so it kind of finishes off with this um, drawing of me thinking through my space and its relationship to all the real-time sort of surveillance and monitoring that's happening there and you know the type of person and the types of domestic routines and behaviors that it uh, produces in me in some way and so just to kind of conclude in this sort of two-part lecture where I've sort of tried to show you some of the research that I do and how that sort of um, informs my output some of the work that I do and how these two things kind of um, uh, speak to each other and so I hope I've kind of made an argument that real-time simulations and technologies discourses um, insulate municipal and commercial actors from uh, democratic accountability and it allows them to make a claim to scientific rationality when the decision making is informed by computer models and anonymized algorithms. And so through claims of data richness and methods of reenactment, uh, these seemingly innocuous and utilitarian platforms are actually incredibly consequential because they're normalizing pervasive information extraction practices. Um, and they may only further entrench the disparities of access and visibility at multiple scales in our cities. Uh, but I hope today I've also made a case for how uh, design uh, reveals and can intervene within these multi-scalar real-time media infrastructures and technologies discourses. Um, and so um, I also hope that I've shown that this asks us to revisit what our definition of architecture is. Um, and how to practice in uh, maybe more critical, engaged, but also really importantly, experimental way. So if we kind of come back to here now, we understand that these three sort of real-time simulations require massive amounts of um, infrastructure. They require massive amounts of information collecting. They require massive amounts of ways to sort of manage our attention and connect our bodies to these global sort of networks. Um, and they also are sort of based on all these sort of abstract theories of how humans actually behave and in some way that gets reinscribed back onto us and so um, there's a kind of a back end to these types of media that's massive and territorial. Thank you so much and we have some time for Q&A and here's a real time simulation of my face. <laughs>